So, welcome everyone. Thanks uh, for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Raul. I'm CTO at 47 Degrees. Um, for those of you that might not have heard of us, uh, we are a, a consultancy that uh, focuses in in training and in functional programming, in actual consulting training and kind of promoting functional programming. And that's what we have been doing for the last probably seven uh, years or so as a main focus. And we are doing a, a few languages, uh, Haskell, uh, Scala, uh, Kotlin, and, and some others. And, and in this particular case, I, I came here tonight to talk to you about the Arrow library and, and some of the stuff we are doing with, with Arrow continuations. Uh, this talk is kind of potentially might be interesting because if you might be coming from a different uh, uh, language, I want an IPA too. <laughs> if you're coming from a different uh, language, you're going to uh, potentially like uh, learn how Kotlin does some of the things uh, differently. And then something very uh, uh, exciting about Kotlin, which is the way it handles uh, IO and, and overall continuations and how that potentially could compare to say Scala or or some other languages uh, which build these abstractions in a different uh, way. So I thought that maybe what I'll do is I'll show you, um, for those of you that might be new to functional programming, some of the things you might learn from this talk is like how to build an ADT. We're gonna be building either, which is very basic. Most of you, if you've been around, you're already acquainted with the, the concept. But what we're going to be building uh, for this ADT is uh, some uh, advanced uh, techniques and one of them is going to be uh, computation expressions. So computation expressions are going to be very similar to what you have in Haskell as denotation or in Scala as for comprehensions, but they're uh, a little bit more wild uh, how they are in Kotlin because they're based on the limited continuations and that has some additional implications that do not surface in languages um, like Scala and Haskell uh, directly. So some of the concepts uh, we're going to be covering in, in this talk, uh, we're going to be discussing a little bit about very lightweight uh, how we're using the notion of the limited continuations to implement uh, this uh, thank you. <laughs> that was the 47 degrees team, people are asking about the transitions. So the 47 Degrees team uh, uh, has a, a lot of resources for marketing uh, in our talks and then do a great job uh, making sure that, you know, we can bring some of these concepts to life uh, better. So all credit goes to them. As I was mentioning, we're going to be covering a few concepts. Uh, we're going to be discussing a little bit about the limited continuations and how we use those to actually fulfill our use case. And we're going to be looking into monadic buying, which is actually going to be the use case. Yeah, we're going to be uh, building. Uh, I think someone is speaking and it's like uh, coming my way. One second. There you go. So we have uh, monadic buying that we're going to be uh, building. And we're going to also be seeing some of these uh, Kotlin features in the language in the type system that might be different from the languages uh, you're used to. So I think it's going to be potentially interesting in different aspects uh, based on, on your background. And to do this, we're going to be using the Kotlin language, of course, and the Arrow library. Uh, the, the Arrow library is a library for functional programming in Kotlin that has been around for around three, four years now. And it's coming uh, close to a stable release soon, uh, 1.0, uh, where we have been in the last four years uh, working towards making the most possible idiomatic Kotlin uh, related to functional programming in some of the abstractions, and also making the sacrifices where some of these uh, abstractions don't make sense uh, in Kotlin because, you know, lack of the language type system features or, or whatever else. So some of the features we're going to be seeing is uh, fun interfaces. Fun interfaces are related to the some conversions and the or the Java single abstract methods uh, conversion, but in a way it allows us to uh, model uh, type classes. 
The other feature we're going to be seeing is uh, suspend functions and, and continuations and how they relate to each other and what does it mean to have a suspend function in Kotlin. And then we're going to be looking at receiver functions. These are a special type of uh, uh, syntactic sugar in your function that is similar to what you have in a Scala like implicit uh, th that allows you to a scope an extension over a receiver uh, type to enhance that type uh, kind of member capability. And finally, we're going to be looking at, into inline functions and how inline functions can serve as a, a scapegoat to avoid using uh, monad transformers, which is actually kind of cool. So the first thing we're going to be looking at uh, is uh, this error continuations reset shift uh, capabilities. Uh, and for those of you not familiar with these primitives, uh, reset is a way when you have a system with continuations to the limit uh, a block in which something has to happen. And we see here that the rule is going to be that anything coming out of this block has to be of the type A, which is what we expect on the left hand side. It cannot be any other type. So this is fairly trivial to build uh, with Kotlin um, based on the on the continuation system that Kotlin uh, provides uh, for suspended functions, which we'll see uh, in a second. But what I want you to get from this slide is basically that once you open a reset block, you have to exit always with the same value. And here we can observe the first property that we observe for monadic bind. For example, if we are in a for comprehension or we are in a block with, with do notation, we always have to exit that computation or that expression with a type uh, of the wrapper or meaning preserving the entry of the point. So this property is uh, something we're going to be exploiting to build um, our monadic computation. The second thing you need to know about reset is that it exposes internally uh, an operator called shift. This operator called shift allows you to at any point in the computation to sort of circuit this computation with a value of A. So it actually matches uh, the requirement of the uh, reset block. But if you think at it, and if you squint and out, you might see that actually this uh, shift looks a lot like an exception. You can think of a, as, a, as an actual type uh, exception or a way to exit a block in a safe way where the value you're going to be exiting always has to be the value that you declare uh, that you enter. And then finally, there is another operator uh, or a specialization of shift, uh, which is something that you might be familiar also with if you are familiar with continuations. And this, is, this is one that uh, in addition to allowing us to shift out of the block uh, straight up to the reset like we saw in the previous animation, in this particular case, uh, we're going to be able to actually complete a callback. And this callback has the peculiarity that we can actually let the program proceed even though we suspend it, even though we did potentially something asynchronous. And this has tremendous implications. Because in Kotlin, this means that you can achieve pure imperative syntax for most or all the monadic data types, but directly on the environment without any special contracts like, say, for comprehensions uh, or denotation. There is a couple of uh, exceptions for that that we'll uh, cover in a second related to monads uh, or data types such as streams or lists that are non-deterministic. But for the purpose of this talk, uh, and for people that are getting acquainted with these techniques, uh, you shouldn't be worrying about that at this moment. So now we're going to be looking at how the Kotlin compiler uh, treats suspended functions. Uh, suspended functions is a special kind of function in Kotlin. And if you come from a Scala or you come from Haskell, a suspend function is the equivalent of being in the I.O. data type or in the I.O. safety net of operations. So it allows you to create pure expressions that you can compose. <clears throat> it tracks the effects, ensuring suspend functions are only called within other suspend functions, so therefore can be composed safely. But additionally, it's going to allow you to do uh, more performant code. And this is how, because how the compiler actually treats this. If we see in the left side, we can observe 
that user code or a user that declares a function like in this case f that returns a name the compiler automatically translates uh, this function into a function that has an additional argument in this case the continuation <clears throat> you can see here the continuation is typed to c but this isn't really that relevant because uh, at the end these are all continuations of object as this is part of the code gen phase and there is type eraser but what's happening is that for every suspend function, uh, it gets the sugar to a function of two arguments, which allows to uh, continue doing things like this. So more complex programs that despite their asynchronous or the fair composition, not even talking here about concurrency or synchronous, the ability to complete a continuation gives us the ability to have in user code always imperative syntax. So you can see in this simplified version of what the compiler will do, as you can imagine, is a little bit more complex. There is a loop that gets uh, created and optimized, and that would be equivalent if you are uh, familiar with the internals of Scala I.O., for example, or any of the I.O. data types. That would be the ADT and the unfold loop of that ADT. In this case, the compiler does the same, but it specializes that loop to your functions and creates an imperative fast loop that is able to jump between the states of the continuation. Therefore, like providing a screaming performance compared to solutions that are based on wrappers, ADTs, or that require allocation to unfold the loop. So how are we going to be using this power to actually build monad bind for either? Most of you are familiar probably with either if you come from a functional background, it appears in, in most uh, languages. And what we're going to be building here, if you notice, is like in this function signature, is a function that goes from either of E and A, meaning we have in the left, uh, the error case A is the success case, straight to A, but without actually worrying about uh, whether this is going to be unsafe. You can think, well, I can already implement this method if it's unsafe, if it throws, right? Because if I find an E, then I want to be out of it. But that will uh, result in an exception uh, at the call side that someone will have to you know, handle somewhere else. And it's not the kind of programming uh, we want to promote. But because this is suspend, and we mentioned earlier that suspend is nothing but the how Kotlin understands I.O., and it's uh, suspend means that it's in a continuation and then the such continuation will have to handle errors and success cases as it IO has to as well. In this case, we are going to be uh, doing suspend to wider. And this should tell you that this has like a little bit of the appearance of either T because if the IO effect is swallowed, then we can transform a straight and combine both concurrent and suspended code and either monadic code in the same environment uh, in a safe way. Okay, so this is the, the objective. We're gonna try to, what you will normally either use in Kotlin uh, with a chain of flat maps or a chain of uh, operators that Normally appear in the functor hierarchy because their only purpose is to be able to, for you to send higher order functions so that they can be uh, applied inside the context. We see that once we have something like monad suspended in book, then inside a block of either, should we have three values of either, then we can simply apply them. And this uh, will be safe because if any of those values is a left, and it cannot produce the value that it's needed for that sum, then we will be able to source circuit uh, out of the block with the either left. So this com uh, computation expression blocks basically give you or bring you applicative style syntax uh, to monadic uh, data types or applicative data types uh, based on this uh, block. So we're gonna be building this in a second. And for those of you not acquainted with uh, functional programming, uh, we're going to be using for this uh, an algebraic data type or an IET. Uh, I'm not going to take much time in, in this part, uh, but basically I want to uh, showcase a couple of the pieces that are important in Kotlin, potentially similar to in, in, in Scala, 
that helps type inference and that people often uh, trip over when they use uh, these data types. So in the case uh, of either, uh, in Kotlin, uh, as in Scala, we have the notion of sealed classes. So there is no proper, no proper support for union types or some types that can be just denoted with their constructors. We have to have this a little more machinery. So model neither is nothing but using uh, a CL class. And here we see the E and A cases, which uh, they represent uh, error or success for all weaker in this case. Why do we care in this case like that? Because either is right bias, meaning that all this computation is gonna happen over uh, the right side. And when we write functions like map, fold, flat map, all of those are going to be bias over up applying the higher order function for composition over this right side. So now that we have the CL class either, the, the next thing we're going to have to be doing is like building our, our little left case or we're going to be holding um, the error. But for that, we're going to be taking a look at how the Kotlin type system works because for this, we're going to be using the special type nothing. Many of you might be familiar, nothing is a button type. And in languages like Kotlin and Scala that mix subtyping or OOP style inheritance, um, with other uh, concepts uh, and other uh, basically problems related to inference mostly, it's nice to have this uh, nothing button type which allows uh, unification because it's implicitly as a type of all of the types. So this looks something like this. In Kotlin, uh, you have a similar structure of a type system as you would have in something like, uh, say, Java, or a language uh, that does not have higher kind of uh, types, but it has some built in packed in features in the language itself to deal with some of these monadic problems. For example, we see uh, we have a top type, any nullable, and that will be equivalent to Java lang uh, object, or in Scala, that would be in a scala three a or null as a union so the, we see uh, similarities in the Kotlin uh, um, type system but this uh, but it's mostly simple it's a monomorphic type system similar to the one uh, in java and we have this as we mentioned the the fact that nothing is always going to be the subtype of all of the other types uh, declared Someone is asking, nothing is like Haskell void. I believe so. Yeah. So basically nothing uh, in, in this case, we're gonna be using it, be why? Because if we're gonna create a left constructor and we wish to depend on either um, by saying that left is an either, which is the subtype relationship we had to establish in, in Kotlin, we can guarantee that there is nothing in the actual right side. And we can do so because this uh, out annotations declare the variance. So here we are saying that either in its A position accepts all subtypes of A. And you know what? Nothing is happens to be one of them. So this allows us to build constructors like left and right and syntax over the language, which use this nothing trick to propagate inference uh, properly. And as also we mentioned that now that we have left, uh, we said the IA is right biased. And then for those of you that might not have heard that concept before, uh, right bias means that we are basically assuming the happy path or successful path for most of our computation is going to be the right side, whereas the left side is gonna be the source circuiting uh, path. And this is kind of like tightly related to, you know, monadic programming in general, what other people call ray-oriented programming. So we're gonna have these uh, paths of success and at some point something might be going wrong. So us as programmers have a few options. We can simply um, just throw exceptions, in which case you will not pollute the method signature with new types but then you also open the, the door for a more partial system or not total in which you know, potentially anything uh, might fail. So 
this is what we're using here either to represent this uh, red circle and green hexagon as you know values and not so much as throwing exceptions but this is, is the same notion and concept so let's take a look at right so in, in the case of right we're going to be doing the same thing and in the right case uh, obviously we're just holding the successful case and we're just going to say and apply the same trick we learn about nothing but to the other side because we have guarantees there is nothing on the left then we might as well you know explicitly type it now the next thing we're going to be doing is <clears throat> building the fold method the fold method of either because either is a strict uh, data type, uh, contrary to popular belief, you don't really need flat map to derive all monads, like depending on whether they're strict or not, you should be able to derive some of their behavior sometimes in fall. In the case of either, this is especially notorious because we're using uh, the delimited continuations. So we're gonna see how that perhaps is everything we need to do two things, optimize monad binding for either for one, and then second, implement the source circuiting uh, case as well. So you might be wondering what is a fold. And we also earlier said that either it was an algebraic uh, data type. And by algebraic data type, we mean that it's like a tree. And this is a tree in which there is operations. This is more or less here we see there's a couple operations. Either can have two operations, a left operation or a right uh, operations. But of course, trees can have much more uh, note. What does it mean folding an either or folding in general any of these structures? So you can think of these ADTs as trees in which, as we mentioned, there are leaves. All of these leaves, uh, when they're being considered for a fold, or, or what a fold is in itself, is considering every single algebraic case of a structure and reducing that case to a, a summary or final value. So this is what we're going to be doing with uh, either. We're going to have this tree of two areas and we're going to run it through a couple of functions and both of them they need to coalesce to the same value. So what does it look like here? So implementing fold uh, on either as we mentioned is going to have uh, a couple of arguments, uh, the left and the right functions and each of one of them has a peculiarity they go towards the type argument B. And basically, this is just to say uh, both functions, they need to end up with the same type of uh, value because that's what folding uh, implies. And either itself is easier to fold because this is an algebraic data type and Kotlin has support for pattern matching that is exhaustive over the constructors of uh, CL classes. So applying uh, the fold is uh, trivial. Okay, so now that we've written fold, uh, I think the next thing we're going to be doing is just basically finally get into writing this effect that we care uh, about. And this is the signature of the effect. Uh, we see a couple of coding things that are potentially new to some people. This uh, function is suspend. What does it mean? It's a function in I.O. This function, it's an operator, it means that even though it's called invoke, for us to call it, we can omit the explicitness or we can add it if uh, we wish so. So this will be similar in a Scala to say apply. And here we're going to be able to um, to basically um, do all of this uh, flatman that we did before, get rid of it once we are able to implement this uh, function and then we can use it inside a block. So to do that, we are going to be using uh, an abstraction from the Arrow Core Continuations Library. It's called Effect. And Effect is uh, a weak abstraction that only has a uh, delimited uh, scope called Control that allows you to do shifting, which is the operator that we learned earlier. So that's a really single power and operator itself uh, as an effect. This is because in Kotlin we can uh, build effects uh, basically like this. There's the notion of fun interface and fun interface, it's uh, as we mentioned earlier, a way to create a both a type and a function 
Uh, so it's about uses for lambda conversions with Java interoperability with the SAM conversions. And it has the ability that we can always leave one abstract member and implement it until the very age. But everywhere else in usage is just used as a function. So while you're not seeing here that abstract member, because we're actually going to implement this operator in bulk, uh, the abstract member that it's in effect is the delimited scope. What is going to allow us to actually implement uh, in bulk? We have not yet set what that scope is, and we'll see in a second uh, how we finish the wiring and how everything works. Okay, so here we see the actual shift uh, operator and we see the implementation as we are using before fold. Uh, we are passing the left function and here where we're using our control and our shift. And we are having here an issue. It says the shift is not going to be able to be called because we are, uh, we are not in a coroutine body. And what you are seeing here uh, what you're seeing here really is basically the, the control of the I.O. monad of the compiler acting, telling you, hey, you are trying to invoke a function in I.O., but this function in I.O., it's not going to actually go through because uh, there is a problem. It captures. If left or if right or one of these lambdas capture the, the context, so if the context was asynchronous, then you need a way to run that. So here is what we mentioned earlier uh, about inline functions. This can potentially be easily solved if we make fold inline. When we make a function inline in Kotlin, <laughs> when shift hit the fan job with left turns, but I can quick put my finger in it, yeah. <laughs> there is a, a bunch of those and shift is kind of like a low level combinator. So it's not something we expose um, to people. But what I'm showing you here is like as a library author or someone that wants to build a powerful abstraction, you're going to be able to use uh, uh, this kind of uh, power in an easy way. So what happens here is that we make fold in line. And by making fold in line, we observe that it works inside suspension. How's that? Because fold is no longer a function. It's not like a template function or a copier function. It's a function whose body gets copied, both inside effectful code, but also uh, inside pure code. So it can serve both purposes. And that implies that this fold uh, is a fold that can be used inside concurrency or inside transformers or inside other continuations uh, of Kotlin without any problem and without, without having to do a stack of transformers like in the case of either T of this and that or whatever. In this model, you can intermix and interleave all of them because all suspended operators by default work inside IO, which is 99% of the use cases uh, that people use in Kotlin, both in backend and in Android development. So now that we have this, uh, uh, one second, this uh, computation block, we are going to assert here a couple of things. The implementation of either here before we were just declaring an interface. Now we are exposing a function. This function, all it does is tells, this is what you need to use to actually build my computation block. And this is part of the error continuations library. You provide the instance of your constructor or what would be the equivalent of uh, your applicative peer. And then you declare the effect handler block that is going to handle this either uh, effect. And in, in the F functions that we see in line 27 is where we see this receiver function feature of Kotlin. We see the function is, uh, has a receiver of either effect E. And that means that anyone calling that Lambda will have immediate access to the scope of the either effect. Being able to access invoke or being able to access any other operators for that algebra uh, directly there without actually having to prefix names, without having to call either effect, dot, invoke, or anything like that. It's just DSL style syntax as we'll see uh, here in a second. 
So we have three values of either that are completely uh, trivial uh, to construct. And now we can go ahead and create the either composition block. And then here we see in this composition block that we are applying or using applicative syntax in, in line 41, 42, and 43. So exactly the same as we would do, say, in four comprehensions. But the advantage uh, here, as you see in the uh, in, in a couple of places, first the fold of the either is optimized for the happy path, meaning that whenever we invoke, there's no need to actually suspend. This is like in stack uh, code. And we don't need to translate to flat map. We don't need to translate to, to map or any other uh, abstractions because we have here control over fast access to the happy path. In the event of the unhappy path, which is uh, the left, uh, we control also that you exit the block with like a type value. So this would be higher penalty in terms uh, uh, of cost, but you can still optimize it away for any data type in a per data type use case. And then once uh, we have uh, all of this uh, composition, we can run it and then observe that this, of course, is going to uh, be returning a value of write uh, three. So this program, uh, unlike for comprehensions and like do notations, has the ability that because these are single shot and single value monadic data types, they can be bound in place without any issues. So if you keep on um, doing more uh, refactoring, or if you can change any of those values uh, back as we'll see later uh, to an even more simplified form that looks nothing like for comprehension and it looks nothing uh, like the kind of do notation that we use in Haskell or Scala. So for the unhappy path, of course, if we do a left and earlier we remember we were source circuiting. So when we run this program, then we're gonna expect that this program, of course, uh, source circuits. And as we saw earlier, we didn't really have to specifically throw an exception ourselves. We were using the shift combinator to come out of the block with the right uh, monadic value. And of course, everything that I've told you about either and all of this uh, is not like we have all of these uh, data type scenarios so we can get completely rid of uh, all of this boilerplate. If you ever use Kotlin, this is something that you can potentially uh, use uh, today over either. And as we mentioned earlier, here I show you kind of like the ANF form of 15, 16, and 17 in those lines where we are putting each a, a statement into a variable and then using the variable, as you would see, potentially enough for comprehension. But uh, as we mentioned, is you can hear binding place uh, in the environment and this is applicative syntax, we can potentially uh, simplify all of those so that they become a more succinct uh, DSL. And we mentioned either, but this is of course not restricted uh, to either. This actually supports multiple data types. In this case here, you're seeing the same effect or the same compression applied over nullable types, which would be the equivalent to option, say in, in Scala or maybe in Haskell. There's a question. What is really applicative syntax in this context? Applicative sy syntax in this context means that within the block of nullable, which starts in line 12, result one, result two, and result three, which are values that return a nullable type, have the ability to call apply as if it was not nullable because any of their applications will source circuit the entire computation. So if any of these values is null, like in the case of result three, uh, this computation returns null. And this is actually happy uh, and fine in Kotlin because null in Kotlin is safe since there is nullable types embedded in the hierarchy. Cool. So we also support many other data types. We said nullable, but uh, 
we have uh, also you know, evolved as you have uh, in a Scala for some stake safety in the environment. <coughs> Although Kotlin also supports a stake safety and the fair computation um, so over suspend uh, natively. So if you are really in a suspended environment, you probably don't need an EVO. But if you are in regular functions and you may want to suspend or do something like this, then you will have to use EVO and pay the cost of allocation for that. So we have another library called FX Coroutines, and this uh, library uh, actually has uh, all of what you will consider the operations of I.O., like part map or part traverse or all everything related to asynchronous, uh, concurrency, software, transactional memory, scheduling, and many other uh, kind of like functional patterns in, in this uh, model. And what I was mentioning earlier here, we're going to be showing a small operation called part map. It's very similar to the zip. I use this animation because I didn't have one specifically. But it's essentially the same. We have, we're going to have multiple potential parallel um, operations that once they complete, they're going to invoke us in the right uh, order. So in our example that we were uh, going to have this done with either, we can actually use the FX coroutines uh, library. And as we can see here in this uh, example, we can have a few functions, just very simple, suspend. The first one returns a thread name. This thread name, uh, usually uh, we are considering an, an effect, and this is why we have the suspend modifier on top. We have later a thread info class with just a couple of uh, properties to hold our results. And here we, we see where all of the exciting part is it's in line 19 and 20. Part map n, unlike in Scala, uh, because we are using here continuations and we don't have I.O., we don't have F. So we don't need to annotate or ever declare F anywhere. Every suspend function is equivalent to a function that is parametric over F because through the asynchronous environment of the delimited continuation, you can jump from that computation to any other monad uh, with the async constructor. So here we have a Parma version that it's taking the thread name function twice, so computing them independently, in parallel, and concurrently, and it's going to stop the results in the thread info constructor once it's done, and immediately destructures the result into the, the tuple or into this destructuring which all data classes, as in Scala, also support. So this gives us like a stream succinct code where we don't have to be worried about the transformer stack and stacking things in the right place because suspension and the other abstractions that Arrow uses for everything related to data types like either, uh, they work together. They're not in, in the world of purity and in the world of impurity. They are, ones are in the world of impurity and the others are copier which are multi-purpose, so they don't require further definitions. So I think this is uh, everything I have to show you today without adding a lot more uh, complexity. Just a few, a couple of mentions in, in kind of future work that I'm gonna, we're going to be doing in this area. We're going to be working in, in building the same support for, as we mentioned earlier, for streams, list, and other kinds of monads that require multi-shot in the continuation. Kotlin is currently a single-shot continuation system, but there is uh, many advances in, in related to Loom and other areas and things we're seeing in the community, which may allow us to do that in the near future. We know it's possible today with a compiler plugin, and that's what we're going to be doing initially to give people that want to try out these features in, in preview mode. And what this implies is that once you have this plugin, well, you'll be able to for comprehend in this style that I showed you today with either uh, our streams and then our other data types and intermix the, the delimited context of uh, different data types and their copier inline functions so that you don't have to worry about transformers or layers or complexity uh, added. 
And the reason is because Kotlin simplifies all of that. It does so by giving you subroutines and allowing you to use imperative syntax that is uh, easier to learn for most people that come from, from Java and other uh, languages uh, without actually having to enforce you into a construction like for comprehensions or, or do notation. And that's all I have. I want to thank you for inviting me to, to this meetup and, and taking the time to listen to this rant about the, the work we are doing. I want to say some of this work has been based on research from other people and also work that we've all done in Aero, including initial work that Roman Lizarov, uh, leader of Kotlin, did regarding the reset shift. And so in GC had to prove the concept of the current continuation system. And the work that Janice and, and Sia primarily have been pushing in the Aero continuations library to make it uh, happen. And I think that's uh, all I have. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks a lot, Robert. Thanks a lot. I, I have two questions. Sure. Um, thanks a lot for uh, this uh, awesome presentation. Um, the first question I have, uh, I'm really sorry, I, I don't speak very good English. Uh, so if they, uh, there is a French people, there are French people in the audience, you can uh, translate me in a, in a proper English. <laughs> Um, in a, you, you mentioned uh, the computation workflow, and uh, I think that uh, in this area, the, the state of the art is uh, F sharp, uh, which uh, introduces a lot of um, syntactic sugar uh, over some uh, neat operator like uh, for, and, uh, while, etc. And uh, the first question is is that possible to have this kind of expressivity in? Uh, Kotlin with Arrow and maybe Arrow Meta, I don't know. And uh, the second question is uh, um, effect uh, class um, seems to to have uh, just one level of uh, parameterization. And you said that uh, with Kotlin you don't have to have a layer of effect. And uh, even I think that asynchronous IO is maybe the most useful effect. Um, imagine if I, I want to have, uh, for example, a, a file system effect or uh, an exception effect. Uh, is that possible to, to have uh, the, the kind of uh, algebraic effect modelization? Yes. Uh, so, so here is the problem. Uh, I'm going to answer the second question, which is the one that I understood better, and I'm going to try to to come back to the first one with more context. So the second question, there is a problem. Kotlin does not support effect polymorphism. Among other things, because Kotlin doesn't have higher kind of types. But the suspension system has that bridge in the sense of suspend functions can be seen as the mother of all monads, right? Yes. So they can allow us to control other monads and, and create other, other useful effects. In fact, the first iteration of the error continuations library, uh, which Janis cracked the multi sub one of the error contributors, it introduced the effects that you can see in, in Haskell libraries like uh, F or some of those where you have non dead chop toys and things like that. The problem with those kinds of effects in, in, in Kotlin is that they're not really ergonomic because while they can be built, they cannot be composed easily. For example, it's not possible in Kotlin at the moment to take these effects and compose them unless you talk about the concrete types, meaning like if you want a list of either, or you want closely of either a complex transformer stack, then you actually need to know what you're targeting to be able to, to build it yourself. So for that reason, uh, the effect interface only includes the control because that control gives you access to the power of the main operators of the linear continuation, which by in turn, you can use to model those complex algebras you were saying, like error without either. And this is just like race, right? Yes. Uh, as an effect. So those are those are po possible, but they do need to be modeled as data types. And they cannot follow the functor hierarchy that uh, Scala cats, for example, follows or that Haskell follows. And the reason is because as we don't have higher kind of types, mm -hmm. uh, we cannot implement those in the same way that doesn't require people calling fix. And this is what something we're getting rid of arrow because we do have 
fire kind of types and those abstractions, including heavy ones like profunctors and, and things like that, that are, in my opinion, they, they don't even make sense in Kotlin. Yes. <laughs> just, because, just, just because people wanted to see if it was possible, it was possible, but it's not, it's not like a, a language or, or something that later gets used. At the end, the concrete data types uh, get used, so everything related to polymorphism has to be done in the in the space of subtyping and in the space of fun interfaces, which gives us a structural polymorphism. Because fun interfaces, as you can see here, uh, you can say, for example, you can define the fun interface for functor map, and that will match list map and all the existing functions. Then you can use those kinds of uh, things to implement some of the abstractions, but there is no real uh, effect polymorphism. But yes, you can build it. Those data types were built. Some of them are, I think, still some in the error continuation uh, test in the history. And you can see what you were saying, non that and some of those from the F and the advanced uh, Haskell libraries. Do you mind repeating the first question? Yes, um, in, a, in F Sharp, uh, there is a, a lot of um, operators which are uh, desired to uh, syntactic specific construction. Uh, like, for example, um, if you implement uh, let and end, you have uh, the applicative do. And uh, if, if you implement uh, uh, sec yield and uh, something else, you have for comprehension, uh, but in for and while. And uh, I will know if, it's, if it is possible to, to have this kind of exclusivity uh, using uh, Arrow and, uh, and other uh, 47 degrees library. Yes, we, we actually, so for example, what I showed you earlier in which I kind of, uh, let's see if I can go back one second to that. So this kinds of, uh, oper so in this particular case, so if you observe the effect interface, the effect interface itself doesn't have monad invoke. Why? Because monad invoke is just one of the use cases of effect for, for either. So in this case here, uh, the operator that you require to implement uh, is in book, which for reasons in Kotlin and in the JVN, uh, when there is a strike data types, we may want to derive them in, in different uh, ways. But this is, of course, not per se limited to monad comprehension by any means. For example, things we build with this thing. I build like crazy interleaving transformer at some point when we were still depending on controlling kinds, when if you are in either T, you can bind or you can apply all these values, the either values, the IO values, and the IO either values, and the either IO values. Why? Because you have the application system in all of those. So the, the transformers and the kind of DSLs, you can actually make them crazy in terms of features of uh, what they do, and they can completely go off of what the traditional uh, techniques used in Haskell in Scala are because you are not constrained by having to type it all yeah. in that sense because you have like this concept of suspension and and shifting allows you to basically you know in the middle of a computation switch types mm -hmm. do something else and then come back to the other type if you want without non-blocking and, and a lot of other nice features so i think it's a different model and we realize we are we are we are bringing this model more ergonomic because Kotlin really when you try to encode it with like haskell uh, in a Scala, of course it can work. You can even do that with Java, I think. But then it's not really that uh, usable. But this way is much more usable and actually eliminates a lot of the problems I thought originally were not possible, like transformers or you know complex mixing of concurrent types with uh, strict data types all in the same environment, which was a desire of mine personally <laughs> when I was uh, working on this. So, and a, a very last question, uh, which software uh, do you use for your uh, slide? Ah, uh, you mean software? Yes, it's Keynote. Sure, I am using uh, OBS. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so OBS, OBS is just like, you know, a video uh, a slides. So what I'm doing is like I have a bunch of setup for slides and the animations to the people uh, so that we set up the transitions and I have a green screen uh, okay. behind me. Nice. Thanks a lot. <laughs> no problem. Yep. Any other questions?
If you don't like it, you can also say it. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering why did you use a fun interface? I mean, uh, this keyword "fun" uh, is was it necessary to implement this uh, kind of feature? It's not necessary to implement the feature, but the difference would be the following: if this was a regular interface, if you see in line 14, when you are actually gonna apply that function and you construct it in line 15, so we construct the either effect, Kotlin will force you to construct an anonymous object instead of taking advantages of the sum conversion compatibility uh, with Java, which also has optimized, optimized cases for allocations compared to that if you have to construct the object manually uh, each time. So essentially a fun interface is equivalent to a function in which you can give it a type. And in this case, you see that suspend has a type parameter B and that's that because that function is concrete, but the abstract function that is the scope, the one that we pass as it in line 15, and that's what we receive from the FX system, that delimited a scope for reset and shift, that function actually uh, itself uh, is treated as a regular function in Kotlin, like a runnable in Java or one of those functional interfaces. So that's what we're using for interface, most, mostly Thanks. ergonomics and a little, a little bit of speed, but not too much. Things pretty clear. All right. Well, if you, if nobody has any other questions, uh, just want to finish up by saying uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. If you're interested in error or you ever uh, do Kotlin. Uh, Aero is a cool place because as, as you're seeing, we can do a lot of uh, crazy things that we're not doing Scala and Haskell before in Kotlin land, which is kind of a, an exciting growing uh, place. Uh, and we also are looking for people that want to contribute and, and help uh, and are interested. So if you ever do Kotlin, feel free to reach out to me directly or to, to the Aero community. And we have like beginner issues and a bunch of different kinds of issues all the way from more hardcore FP stuff like we discussed today from much simpler uh, things. So thank you so much.